key to see the sign language and the voice and harmony together. And uh, wow. And I see the singing in sign language. And then at the same time, I love to observe the hearing people and their expressions as they sing and their voices. Very interesting as I see that coming together as the hearing sing and then the deaf sign. Praise the Lord that He uses talents and abilities and that God, God can use anything. He can use our talents for His glory. So we praise the Lord for that song. We did have a note from Isaac and Amber, and they just wanted to express their gratitude to the church. They said, thank you for helping us as we moved, and we appreciate your uh, financial gift as we were in financial need. It was a blessing to us. Thank you for that as we consider our future and God's will for us. We love you, and thank you very much. That's from Isaac and Amber. So I wanted to share that with you. Isaac is running the live streaming this morning. Amber is up there, and she is training, and she's learning to uh, do the PowerPoint ministry. So Hannah is working with Amber together this morning. Hannah does a great job with PowerPoint. It's not easy. Last week, Amber did it for the, that Sunday. Amber, he told me, he said, wow, this is, this is a lot of work. And the PowerPoint is a tremendous amount of work. And so we appreciate her hard work and all that she does. That yesterday we had that wedding. What a great blessing it was to see Joel and uh, Sarah as they came together in matrimony. And now they are on their honeymoon. And I said to uh, Joel, I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm not going. And I said, okay. And he said, well, I don't know, maybe uh, Ben. Maybe Ben knows. And he said, no, no, he doesn't know either. I'm not telling him. So Ben said, well, he's on earth. Somewhere on earth, that's where they are. So, I don't know. They didn't go to the moon. We know that for sure. Many of you have heard about the earthquake in Italy this morning. It happened about 2 or 3 this morning, 6.6 on the uh, Richter scale. I'm not sure how many people died. But last, the last few months, Italy has experienced many earthquakes. 300 people have died over the span of that time, but it's very close to Rome, and if you consider where Rome is and where Donna the Q is, I'm not sure if you know, where, uh, know her, but she was one of our missionaries in the past, and she lives in Italy now, so let's pray for her and um, all of Italy as they're going through this earthquake. Of course, for the last several weeks now, We've been studying the Word of God, we've been looking at the uh, construction of the temple, and as we consider the temple and how God gave Solomon the instructions for the temple, we remember last week discussing and preaching about the Ark of the Covenant. If you recall, when we uh, talked about the Ark of the Covenant, they brought the Ark, they brought it to the temple, and God's presence was there in the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. And after all of that was completed, the next step was for Solomon to proclaim to the people, uh, proclaim to all the people, a message. And Solomon, Solomon, Solomon wrote to the people and he encouraged the people. And he said to them, look within your heart. Look within your own hearts. And so this morning as I preach, we're going to be speaking about the right heart. I can't see within your own heart. I can examine my own heart. So we're going to speak about the right heart. As we look at chapter 5 and then move on to chapter 6, the Ark of the Covenant is in its place in the temple. And as we move into chapter 6, we see the praises and the thanksgiving and the people coming before the law of the Lord, making sure their hearts were right before Him. And Solomon proclaimed to the people, Make sure you have a righteous heart before God. David, Solomon's father, David was a man after God's own heart. And Solomon, as he wrote in the books of the Chronicles here, he said to the people, remember to look at your own heart. I'm sure many of you remember the story of how God chose David. God chose David as a shepherd, a lowly shepherd, 
God chose him to become king over all of Israel. And so David ruled and reigned, and God revealed his vision for the temple to David. David made the preparations. David wanted to build the temple, but God said no. God said no, you can't do it, but I'll allow your son Solomon to build it. And God, God saw the heart of David. He saw the excitement that was within David's heart. He saw what was there, but he allowed Solomon to build the temple. He looked at David's heart. And as I studied through these verses, specifically wanting to look at uh, about five different verses that we're going to be looking at in conjunction with the heart, we're going to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 6, specifically verse 8, 7, 8 to 14, and then down through verse 30. And we're going to be looking at the heart. We're going to look at, uh, as Solomon speaks to the people, he says, make sure your heart is right before God. God teaches the people as they're building, they built the temple, and they brought the Ark of the Covenant to his place within the temple. Solomon says, well, I want to see a people whose heart loves God, people who are looking to him and following after him. In verse 7, it says, now it was within, within the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Look at verse 8. But the Lord said to David, my father, for as much as it was in thy heart to build a house for my name, thou didst dwell, and that it was in thy heart. So David had a desire to build a temple and to do the best job he possibly could for the name and honor of the Lord. And then in verse 8, it speaks of that. Then skipping down to verse 14. In verse 14, it says, And said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven, nor in the earth, which keepest the covenant, and shows mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all, with all their heart. Then let's look down to verse 30. Verse 30 says, and I, you're going to have to look it up in your, in your Bibles. Verse 30 it says, Then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive, and render unto every man according unto all his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou only, thou only knowest the hearts of the children. Then look at verse 38. Verse 38 says, If they if they return to thee with all their heart, and with all their soul, in the land of their captivity, whether they have carried them captives and pray toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house which I have built in thy name, for his name. This was built for God and for His name. And so as we consider the people and the heart of the people, we need to apply this to ourselves. We have Jesus Christ living within our hearts. And as we consider that, we need to look at our own hearts and we need to realize that there's something we need to do with our own hearts. And if we look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6, turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6, says, Not with thy service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And that's emphasized there again, from the heart. Are you willing to do what's right with a right heart before God? Because that's what God wants. He wants your heart to be right before Him. Are you willing, in your own heart, in your own lives, are you willing to have a heart that is right before God? Are you willing to please men and say, it's my way and my will? That's not what God wants. God has a desire for us to please Him with a heart that's right, that wants to follow His will, that wants to follow what God wants. Because God's path is the best way for us. 
And we need to consider our own hearts. And we need to look to Him and say, I want to do what God wants, not what I want. The people, as they, you know, when they came out of Egypt, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, we're going to look back at some of the things that they went through. And as we consider these things, we look at our own hearts. You have Jesus Christ. You have the Holy Spirit living within you and within your own heart. And are you going to be hard-hearted or are you going to be tender towards God? Are you going to be compassionate or are you going to be one that's obstinate and not caring about what God's plan is for our lives? We need to have hearts that are spoken to to be used of God. If you want a heart that's right before God, Allow Him to rule and reign in your life. You can go to God and you can say, God, would you be the ruler of my life? God, would you do that? Because it depends on us. We want the peace of God within our lives and within our hearts. Then we must come to the point where we say, God, I'm allowing you to rule in my life. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let's skip down to ch uh, chapter 3. Yeah, this is the incorrect verse up here, so look with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, not Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And I've been thinking about that verse, even, you know, since the time that I got away from the Lord in 1975, I was not pleasing God, I was not doing what He wanted, I was seeking Him, and seeking what I wanted, really, in my own life, and in my own heart, trying to find peace, and struggling, and I went back to Tennessee Temple University in 1975, 1973, I had gone to Tennessee Temple for my first year, and then I quit after that first year. And God spoke to my heart. He said, you need to go back to Tennessee Temple University in 1975. And the Lord impacted my life from this verse, Colossians 3, verse 15, one of my favorite verses, even still today. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. You see, this is key. This is key. If you look at the Jewish people, and he said, Solomon said, do you want a heart that's right before God? There's something that I want to share with you, and I'd like to pray before I do. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, for your word this morning. Help us as we understand it. You give us clarity as we consider what Solomon taught people, as he wrote to the people, as to what they needed to do, to sacrifice and offer up the ark to you, God. Solomon came before you and bowed before you in prayer and announced there was no other God except for you. And Lord, we need to do the same in our own lives. We need to realize that you're here to help us, to help us have a right heart before you, God. And I pray that you'd be with us, bless us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So there was something I was wanting to share with you. Is Solomon came to the people and he reminded the people, he said, remember, remember, as the people came out of Egypt, the Jewish people came out of Egypt, and as they went through the wilderness, and they went through all that they had to experience there, remember that God was with them and said, I am your God, depend on me. And he brought the cloud and the pillar of fire before the people. At night, they had that pillar of fire that led the people protected them. During the day, they had the cloud that was there. The presence of God was with the people with those two uh, with those two things. And the Jewish people were able to look to that pillar of fire. And you can imagine a pillar of fire in the sky. And it would be a light that would help them as they traveled the journey. And it was a way to protect them too. And you can picture this. As you picture this, as they're in the wilderness for 40 years, they had this pillar of fire at night that moved as they moved. The pillar of fire with the Ark of the Covenant as they journeyed and traveled through the wilderness and the presence of God was there. And as, they, as the people looked to this pillar of fire, they were able to remember what God did for them and who He was. But this is a picture, and this is a picture of the pillar of fire that I want to 
share with you. If you can pull that up here on the, the screen for us, please. It's the pillar of fire. There we go. Just a, just a representation of what it could have looked like. So there they are. The, the tents are set up. The tabernacle is in place. And they would have had this all established and all set up. And then you see the pillar of fire coming out from the Ark of the Covenant. And the people would have been able to follow this by night. And as they journeyed and as they moved from area to area, they were able to depend on that pillar of fire. And then if you could pull up the other picture, please. Okay, here's the pillar of uh, the cloud. So the people, and let me give you just an illustration. As we consider the cloud that they followed, the people followed after this cloud, and as Joshua led the people, and it was over the military, and they brought the ark of the covenant to the places that they went, uh, and then they went into Jericho, and they surrounded the walls and marched around the walls of Jericho. The ark of the covenant, God's presence was there, and the people carried the ark of the covenant around the walls of Jericho, and then it brought destruction on that seventh time that they went around, and the heat, this was a reminder he was reminding the people that God had the power over all things and all things of their life. Solomon was reminding the people that we need to have a love of God. And he said, God wants to see hearts that are right before him. God wants hearts that are right. And as I considered those, the pillar of fire and the cloud, it was a remembrance to the people of Israel. It's a picture of God and the power that God had through the fire and through the clouds. And he was able to show the people... Don't look at anything else, but look to me. Look to your God, who has the power over the clouds and over the fire. Look to me, look to me and follow me. Because if you don't follow me, your life will be in turmoil. Follow after me. Don't go back into sin and the destruction that that brings. Bring your attention to me. And for 40 years, and I looked into the story, that for 40 years they had the pillar of fire and the cloud. This did not cease until they came across the, into the promised land. They came to the point where they built the temple and God's presence was there in the temple. And God was the one who chose Jerusalem. He was the one who chose that the temple would be right there in Jerusalem. The people, they didn't debate, they didn't choose. God chose the location. He chose that as a special place because God's sovereign and control. God is the one established this year. Exodus 3 verse 13, 21 and 22 we're going to look there. Exodus chapter 13 Exodus chapter 13 verses 21 through 22 and they, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way and by night a pillar of fire so the reason they had this cloud they would have had this cloud with them and Solomon as he's sharing with the people he's reminding them but they had this pillar of the cloud to lead them where to go. The people didn't know where to go. They were in the wilderness. They didn't know where to go. If you look throughout history and you look at as my people migrate, they these people were being led by God because they couldn't go their way because if they went their way, their lives would be a mess and they wouldn't know where they were going. They had to follow God's way. They had to do things the way that He wanted. And it says that by night, the pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of cloud by day. You see, God didn't just forsake them. No, God was there alongside them. So the nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. This means that God, God revealed himself to people and his love for them. And he reminded them, you have a responsibility to follow me. You, don't, you do not follow your own path and your own way. You follow my way and the things that I have for you, you follow me. So many Christians today are off or doing their own thing, not wanting to follow God. But we need a heart that is no longer hardened by sin and doing what we want, but following what God wants. We need a heart that's tender before God. Number one in our outline, God came within. God came within. God had a purpose purpose. So his purpose. And then we see in the scriptures, verse 1, 2nd, 
2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 1. Then says, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 1. Then said Solomon, the Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. God came within that pillar of the cloud. And the people looked to that cloud and knew that God's presence was there within the cloud. That God was in control. It was his way. The people could follow his path, his will. As I read through the scriptures, Solomon had a desire. He had a desire to see God's blessing upon his people. He had a desire to see the people happy before God. He had a desire to look to God as, and declare the people to be God's people. Verse 5 and 6, we see where the Lord says, David had a heart. He had a heart that was motivated and eager to do what's right. God was the one who chose Jerusalem, not the people. The people, they didn't come in contemplation and say, okay, let's, let's go and choose Jerusalem. No, the scriptures say God spoke and he chose Jerusalem. He was the one who chose that location. God has authority over our lives and in our hearts. God wants what he wants for your lives. We need to go before him and say, God, my life is given to you. My will is no longer mine, but it's your will. It's what you want. And whatever you want in my heart and my life, I'll do it. Many Christians don't want that today. And it brings us to a question of why. Many Christians say, I don't want that. And I don't understand because it brings peace. And it's the best way that we can have God's peace. But so many Christians are up, obstinate, stubborn, and don't want to follow God's path and His life and surrender to Him. We need to do that. We need to follow Him. We need to surrender our lives to Him. Secondly, we see His purpose, but as we consider coming before the Lord with the right heart, we need to come before Him because God makes a commitment and a promise to us. Just like He did to the Jewish people, He said, you are my people and if you will obey me, and I, I will be here and I love you and I promise I will never leave you or forsake you. And he's reminding the people, remember what I'm here to tell you. Remember to follow me and obey me. If we look at verse 7, verse 7, 8, 9. Let's look at Second uh, Chronicles chapter 6, verse 7. Now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Verse 8. But the Lord said to David, my father, for as much as it was within thy heart to build a house for my name, but as well as that it was in thy heart. He's speaking of David now. David, he says, David had a heart that was right before God, and he wanted to worship God. He wanted to do what's right. He wanted to, to love God. He wanted to do what God's will was. And in the scriptures, we see that God gave David the vision for the temple the building of the temple and what God's desire was. And God made a commitment and promise for his people. He made a promise. The Lord said, I have a promise for you, for, for you, David, for your people, for Solomon. If you will follow me, if you will obey me, and then when the ark and the temple were completed, if you will live for me and allow me to rule and reign, I will be there and take care of you. God made a commitment. He said, will you, will you honor me? Will you have a right heart before me? Will you follow me and honor my name? The name of the Lord. And as we as believers, we want to emphasize the name of the Lord. We want to come with hearts that are, that are honoring His name. We see that repeated many times. The name of the Lord being honored and lifted up. Five different times we see name of the Lord being mentioned here. The Lord came to Solomon. He spoke to Solomon as, as he spoke to the people. Solomon came to the people and he reminded the people. He said, God has promised to be in your life and in your hearts. And as a people, you've built the temple and you've brought the Ark of the Covenant to its place within the temple, but don't think about self. Don't think about what you've done. Don't think about how you've built the Ark of the Covenant. You've built all these things because it's God and it's all for His honor and His name. 
It's not for the name of people. It's not for the Jewish people. It's not for our name. It's for His name and His honor and His glory. And when you realize that, that you want a right heart to worship God, and it's because through His name, when we realize that, we will have a desire that we know and recognize that, the, that Jesus Christ lives within us. And we want to give His name Lord. Number three. One thing that's interesting that I want to share with you. Solomon had a heart that was spoken to, to as they built the uh, platform. And they built a platform in front of the temple so that he could come and speak to the people. And they had this uh, about seven and a half feet seven and a half feet uh, dimensions. It's about 8 by 8. And then 4 feet high. Okay, so about 4, 4 and a half feet high. It was a platform. So that uh, that was made of uh, bronze. And as they brought this, it was for Solomon to stand on this platform before the people. And all the Jewish people were congregated together because they wanted to they wanted to hear what their king, Solomon, had to share. They wanted to hear, they wanted to listen with their hearts and their minds and, their, and open their eyes to what God was doing here. And so Solomon came before the people. And Solomon, in excitement, talked to the people about building the temple and the Ark of the Covenant and all this, the seven years that were involved in doing this. And he came to the people and he said, It is now time to praise His name. And to exalt His name. His name is above all else. What about your, your life and your own heart? Do you, do you put God's name first? There's no other name above His name. His name should be above all else. The name of God. How many of us truly want God's presence within our own hearts and our own lives? Look at verse 12. Second Chronicles Chapter 6, verse 12. And he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands. He spread forth his hands. He stood before the people at the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation and spread forth his hands. He didn't just come and just lazily come before the Lord. He came in reverence for God, put his hands out before God. Look with me at verse 13. This verse speaks to my heart. If you look at Solomon, for Solomon had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long and five cubits broad, three cubits high, and had set it in the midst of the court. And upon it he stood and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. He put his hands toward heaven. He took his hands before heaven and looking to God in heaven and saying, Lord God, I'm yours. I'm here surrendered. On his knees before God. He did this on his knees. And we see the key verse in verse 14. He had said, O oh Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven. There is no God like thee, nor in the earth, which keepest the covenant and showest mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. He's saying, Lord God, you have shown us mercy and compassion, and you've helped us, and you've led us, and the Jewish people have seen your help. And we know that there is no other God except for you and you alone. You have shown us mercy. But without you, God, we're nothing. Do you have a heart that loves God? Do you truly love Him? Do you love Him or is it just something you just kind of nod your head to where you don't really care? Are we dedicated with our whole heart and our own soul and our whole mind before Him? Are you willing to come and say, I want a heart that is right before God. 
There's a simple answer there for you, and that is to surrender. To surrender. The Jewish people looked to their king and they said, yes, we will surrender, just like Solomon did. Solomon came before the Lord on his knees. He came up before the Lord, pro proclaimed who God was, and said, God, here I am, I surrender to you. You see, Solomon didn't think about the people and what they thought of him. He thought about what God thought of him. He knelt before God and said, God, thank you for what you have done. Thank you that you alone are God. What about us in our own hearts and in our own lives? How many of us will come before him and kneel before him and say, I'm saved and I want my life to be surrendered to you, God. I want you to control my life. I want you to use me. And there's so many Christians today that say, no, thanks. If that's you, then you are crazy. If you don't want that, if you don't want God to control you, I'm telling you, you're crazy. We need the mercy of God. We need God. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, you believe in eternal life, and you have that gift of salvation, you realize that He has taken our place, then we need to come before Him and give thanks to Him. We need to realize that He he has made a commitment to us and we need to commit ourselves to Him 100%. But there are so many people that say, no, not me. How many of you are sold out to Him? How many of you are, are completely surrendered to Christ and said, saying, Lord, you own me. Lord, you are in control. Lord, you are mine. Father, you're in control of me. You have adopted me, and I no longer belong to this world. I belong to you and to him alone. Are we allowing Christ to rule and reign in our lives? Are we allowing God to do that? Then look at verse 14 through 16. He says, O oh oh Lord God, there is no God like thee in the heavens. Or the earth. Let's look at verse 14. It said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee. And then if we look down at verse 15, thou which hast kept with thy, with thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him, is biggest with thy mouth, and has fulfilled it with thy hand, as it is this day. Just as you promised my father, David, you will not fail me. He speaks of that. You have, Lord God, thank you so much. I surrender to you. Because, Lord, you will never fail our people. You will never fail us. Solomon proclaimed that to the people. Throughout the generations, God made a commitment to the Jewish people. He said, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, I'm still here for you. I am there and I've got mercy upon you, upon my people. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Lord promises you He will never fail. He'll never forsake you. We need to come before God. We need to prove that He, he will never fail us. And let me tell you a, a story about our Christian school and our college. You know, we have come to a point so many times where we are just scraped by our church. Sometimes financially we're straight, we're having a difficult time. If we look at our Christian school, we just recently our air conditioning is not working and we use that for heat as well. Mrs. Bradley texted me and she said, I don't know what to do, Pastor. Um, and you know what? Our money in the bank is just, ooh, it's just that much. Very little. And so, you know, sometimes it's tough. You think, well, we're comfortable and we're rich, but you know what? Uh, you know, we've got house bills and we've got mortgages and all these other things to take care of as well. But we looked at the price and it's, I don't know, about 4800 or so, roughly $4,000 uh, for a new unit. And I'm thinking, wow, this is just a little tiny air conditioning unit, condenser unit, $4,800. Bradley and I were talking about it. We just kind of gave each other this look. And Mrs. Bradley was like, I don't know what we're going to do. And I'm thinking, I don't know what we're going to do. So Mrs. Bradley contacted another company and they came out. And they, boy, the one company had a little bit higher in price. And we didn't know what we were going to do. And I don't know, we were maybe going to maybe have some units that we could plug in for some heat just temporarily. As we get into cooler weather, we've just been praying. And, uh, 
uh, you know, maybe we'll have to wait, wait, hold on to it until January. We just been praying, God, you be with us. You help us. And uh, Calvary Baptist Church, we, uh, I know there was a man there that worked on the air conditioning. And he, uh, last Thursday, they sent somebody out here. And he looked over the unit and they said, we have a member of our church that lives in, I think it was in Dalton. And the father and the son that own a business there, and they, they do air conditioning and stuff like that. And they said, we'll come and we'll look it over. And they looked over and they said, yeah, about five, about 5,000 was what they thought they, they said. And I just remember in the back of my mind thinking, ouch, ooh, that's rough. And the one, the one guy said, let me do some things, give me a little bit of time, and let me talk with another pastor and just see what we can try to figure out. So, of course, I sat, and you know, he, he went out and sat in his vehicle, and he was talking to some people, and he came back and he said, I've got some good news for you. He said, I talked to one pastor, and um, we spoke, and then, you, you know, guess what? He said, total, you know, with the unit, with the unit, uh, 3,800 uh, unit, the, it's 3800 you know, and then they've got to do some fix repairs and things like that. And uh, you uh, you probably don't know all of the technology and all these things, but he said, you know, all together, um, about 4000 in the church voted that they're going to pay for half. This church that I spoke to, they said they would pay for about half, half the price. And uh, so about 2500 2600 they would pay, and then we would pay about... Uh, I think it was about uh, 2,500, 1,800 or so to 2,500. And so, even with that, you know, we see the proof of God and what He's done, the power of God. We see the power of God in that situation. We need to be careful not to forget. Don't forget what God has done, what He is still doing, and how amazing it is, even in that situation. We know that God will take care of it all. We can give our hearts to Him and say, God, I'm turning it all over to You. God, here I am. I can't do anything, but I mean, I love You, but I know that You can take care of it. God, I come before You with a heart that wants to confess and ask forgiveness. Lord, I love You. Will You take care of this? You know, we've been here now for 22 years since 1994. God has never failed us. He has never failed us. You know, when my heart is not right before God, I have to come to repentance before God and say, Lord, forgive me. I've been angry or I've done this. And Lord, I need to come before you with the right heart because I want that for myself. I want a right heart. And I hope you would say the same. He will never fail us. And when we consider these verses, we consider that He will never fail us. And we will fail, we will fail without God's help. And God is there alongside us to help us. And in the scriptures it says that He, I, I promise never to fail you. I will be with you. If you will heed my way and walk my law. Because that was walked before me. Will we obey God? Will we follow His law? Because the Jewish people came at times where they did not want to obey Him. They didn't want to listen to Him. But God said, you need to follow me. You need to listen to what I have to say to you. Our way is not the way of God. We need to follow His way. Do you, in your own life, do you come before God saying, I want to do what you want. I want to follow your law. I want to do what you want, Lord. Not what I want. I want to do everything that you want me to. I want to follow your law. The Word of God. The Word of God. If you rebel, then you're rebelling against God's Word. You're rebelling against Him. If you say, I, I, don't, I don't want His way, then you're breaking His law. If you rebel against His Word, then it's rebelling against His law. The Word of God instructs us on how to live for Him and how to follow His will. And His mercy is there to lead us and we just simply need to obey and follow Him. Walk before me, is what the Scripture said. Walk before me. See, the people saw the temple. And they saw the worship. and They saw the sacrifices that were given. They saw the Ark of the Covenant. The people knew 
that God had made a promise there. The Ark of the Covenant was the commitment that God had made that He would take care of us if we will walk righteously before God. And if you are not walking righteously before God, then there are going to be problems. There's going to be turmoil. And there's going to be increased turmoil. Maybe you say, I'm so sick and tired of the problems that I'm going through. And I'm, I'm the same way. Maybe you're tired. And you say, I am tired. Maybe it's a heart issue. And all over, so many of us feel the same way. We need to learn. We need to learn to live for God. We need to learn to follow His path for us. If you have that desire, then obey Him. Obey His word. If you've got the desire for a right heart, then obey Him. There's so many Christians where they're hiding their sin and they are talented at it. They're skilled at hiding their sin. But God sees right through that. He sees it all. He says, He says, are you going to do it my way or are you going to do it your way? You know what? If you decide to do it your way, I'll let you do it. There will be a mess. What's sad is that I've had so many friends of mine who've gotten away from God. And they're never happy. There's never true happiness there. Because they don't want to live for God. They don't want to do what He wants. Oops. Oh, my finger glasses. I broke them. <laughs> anyway, we'll praise the Lord regardless. Stepped on my glasses. Um, but to walk in His law, to please Him and walk in my law, that must walk before me. That's what the scripture said. Walk before God. <sighs> to consider prayerfully his, his prayer before God. You see, Solomon, and next week we're going to look into it some more as we preach next week, but we're going to look at uh, 13 different prayer requests that he came before God, 13 different requests that he made. We're going to look at that next week. 13 different requests that Solomon came before God. Very interesting as we look into this next week. Solomon had a reason for giving these requests to God. We're going to look more into that next week. But as we consider that Solomon came on his knees before God, he came on his knees before God and he said, okay God, I'm coming on my knees before you. I'm pouring out my heart to you. And I'm crying out to you, Lord God. We see in verse 16, Verse 16, if you can pull that up. Verse 16. It says, Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him. And then verse 17. You can go there. Verse 17. Now then, O Lord God of Israel, let thy word be verified, which thou hast spoken unto thy servant David. Let's look at verse 19. <laughs> Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication or his request. If you come before the Lord with a right heart and you're kneeling before him, just as Solomon did, he came before the Lord. He said, Lord, I have these requests that I have given to you. Lord, I want to give these over to you. I'm turning this all over to you. And God will listen, just like he did with Solomon. He will listen to you. He said, my God, he cried out to my God, O oh Lord, my God. So many of us, sometimes we say, okay, Lord God, give me a good day. Yeah. Is your heart in the place it should be? Or are you truly crying out to Him? I mean, this is serious business when you come before the Lord. Lord God, I cry out to you. And if we cry out to God, the Lord God will answer us in His strength and power. But so many of us don't think about the seriousness of prayer. Solomon. Solomon cried out to the Lord. He, here, he, here he is, a wise man, wisest man to live, a, a great king, strong and mighty, and he in humility comes before God on his knees and surrenders to God and cries out to the Lord and says, Lord God, here I am as your servant before you. And you look upon me day and night. He knew that God's presence was with him. He knew that God's uh, 
that God's eye was upon him. And he said, O Lord God, put thy name here. To hearken unto the prayer which thy servant to pray for this place. How many of us today, how many of you as a believer truly believe that God is faithful? We see God's faithfulness. You know, just like the Jewish people who wandered through the wilderness, God was faithful to them. He helped them. He was faithful. He came alongside them. God is faithful. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9 through 13. Know therefore that the Lord that God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. To a thousand generation upon generation upon generation. We have a responsibility to teach God's commandment to the next generation. We have that responsibility to share it to our next generation. So many times we say, oh no, no, no bother. We need to come to a point where we teach the next generation, where we teach them more about who God is. To the next generation, to a thousand generations. And then it says, and he repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Verse 11. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments. And then let us go down to verse 13. And he, he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn and thy wine and thy oil, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep the land which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee. But it depends on your heart. Do you love him? Do you truly, truly love him with all your heart? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful. That's what it says. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, He is faithful. Jesus Christ is faithful to us. And if you as a true believer, if you're truly saved today, then you can follow Jesus Christ. You can follow Him through the Holy Spirit. You struggle and you go through, through things in life and things happen. We can realize that the Holy Spirit is there. He can help us. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're dealing with things that are making you upset. You're struggling in life. It is so vital for us to come to the point where we say, God, you are faithful. We need to be faithful to him too, realizing that he is faithful to us. God is faithful to us. What about us? Are we going to be faithful to him? Jesus Christ is in our hearts and our lives. We need to be faithful to God. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we look into the Word of God, we can love His Word, we can commune with Him, and He with us. We can please Him, we can, we can come to a point where we enjoy His fellowship. None of us want problems, none of us want to go through turmoil. Let's turn to the Word of God, and let's realize that He's got the answer. If you are saved today, is there fruit in your life? Is there fruit? Is there faithfulness? Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Look at this last little bit. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So if your heart's not right before God, you can come before Him and say, God, I need your help. I need your help. The Lord is my help. How many of us do not believe that? We should believe that He will help us. He will help us. The 
Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. When we get so fearful of what the world can do to us, and I don't know if you know the state of Georgia just recently, of some things that are going on in the state of Georgia. The government, the governor, and uh, there's several groups of pastors. And uh, there was a group of pastors, there was a pastor in Georgia, near Atlanta, where the government said, I want to see your sermons. And he said, no, separation of church and state, amen. Amen, separation of church and state. And they said to him, we want to see your sermon. So they went to court. He wouldn't give them a sermon. And they got several thousand people that said, no, the government does not have the right to tell the pastor what he should, what he should share or not share. That was happening here in our state of Georgia. And they've got, you know, they're, then there are 10 days left till the election day. And you know what? We realize that it's all in the hand of God. God is in control. Our religious freedom, though, is deteriorating rapidly and decline, but we need to give thanks to God that we have a God who is in our lives, in our hearts, and He is in control. And it, no it does not matter what the world may do to us. We don't need to fear them, because you know what? They are going to ignore the law of God, and I, you know what? If they tell me not to do something, it doesn't matter what they tell me to do. I am going to preach the Word of God. If they come to me and they say, I want to see your sermon, and they say you're wrong for what you're you're preaching, I'll go to jail because I'm going to share the word of God because I will not rebel against His law. If I have to go against the law of man in order to follow the law of God, then I will do it. You know, this is happening here in Georgia with this pastor where they said, we, you have to give us your sermon so that we can look it over. And he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And just as we get ready to close today, this morning, how many of you say, I want to heart this right before God. I want to serve Him. I want to do what's right. I've got a desire to do this. Then how many of you would say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes. I surrender to you. I turn myself over to you, Lord. Would you lead in my life and in my heart today? In Psalm, if you turn to Psalm chapter 31, Psalm chapter 31, verse 3, it says, For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Lead me and guide me. How many of you will say to the Lord, Lord, lead me, guide me, Lord? Or are you brushing him off today? Do you think you're more intelligent than he is? Now, let me tell you something. God is way more intelligent than you. Then it's time for us to come to him and say, Lord, lead me, guide me. And then if you turn in uh, Psalm 48, verse 14, it says, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Every single day, every single day, we need to come before Him in repentance and say, Lord, would you forgive me for what I have done? You know, we make wrong decisions, don't we? When we make those wrong decisions, we need to go to God and say, God, guide me. I'll tell you what, I've made many mistakes. You have too. We've all made mistakes. I make mistakes. You make mistakes. And you might say, no, not the pastor. No, we all. We all make mistakes. And in those mistakes, we come before God. God, you know I want you to guide me. Forgive me. If your heart is right before God, and you come to Him and you say, God, guide me, let me tell you what, there will be joy. There will be true joy in your life. We will go to Him and let Him guide us. Psalms, chapter, uh, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 19. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Before I close, again, that verse says, Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart way. You, when you turn to the Lord in wisdom, turn to Him. And we don't know what may happen in the future. You might have some situation that comes up with your house or your car or whatever, your clothes or your job, whatever it may be. When you turn to Him and say, God, will you guide me? Will you guide in each situation? Maybe it's a job situation. You're saying, God, I cannot have a job. 
you turn to him and say, God, I need a job. I'm crying out to you. The Lord will help you. The Lord will guide you. There's so many decisions that we have to make that we can turn to God. We can ask Him. You know, maybe it's a spouse, spouse situation. You know, Joel and Sarah just got married, of course, just yesterday. And I remember they came to my office and they said, Pastor, what are you thinking? We're thinking about getting married. And God brought them together in a beautiful way. God has a desire for you. Maybe you're thinking about a spouse, a husband, or a wife. You need to pray to God for his guidance. Yesterday that wedding was so beautiful, and I'll tell you what, because Joel, he did what was right. He had a heart that was right for God. And Sarah likewise. They had a heart that wanted to please God, that wanted to follow him, that wanted his guidance, and said, God, what do you want? And God brought them together. Let me tell you again, God will never, ever fail us. If your heart's convicted this morning. Maybe God is speaking to you. Having the right heart before Him. You know, it's easy to get bitter, it's easy to get angry and upset, but there's no room for that. There is no room for that. Maybe you're bitter and you're angry and you're upset about something. It's time for us to come and say, Lord God, I turn it over to you because I want to do what you want. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray that you speak to us, help us understand what your word is as we consider the heart the right heart for you, God. I pray that we follow your path and your will for our lives, that we would realize that you have the best plan for us. So, Lord, I just pray that you give us peace. Help us to uh, come before you, Lord, as those who are believers, that we would realize that we can surrender to you, Lord. And we have not done that yet. Lord, I pray that each one would turn to you. And, Lord God, you would reveal your will and your desire and your plan for our lives as we surrender to you. Lord, just bless this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.